the Northern Elders Forum is demanding an investigation by the federal government into the bombing. The group described uh, the incident as a matter of serious concern regarding uh, the safety and well-being of civilians in conflict zones. In a statement, the forum said a thorough investigation is essential to ensure uh, justice for the affected civilians, uh, prevent future occurrences, and uphold the principles of human rights and international humanitarian law. The organization also condoled uh, with the families of the victims. Right, we're joined now by Sadiq Garba Shehu, who is a uh, retired uh, group captain, uh, of course, joining us on Newsnight tonight. Good to see you. Unfortunate circumstances uh, with the Kaduna bombings. Let's get your thoughts first. And could this have been averted? How? Oh, thank you very much. <clears throat> first, my condolences to the families of those who lost their loved ones and also commiserations for the members of the Nigerian Armed Forces, because I know they too, you know, they'll be in a kind of uh, shock and despair about this unfortunate incident. Uh, but unfortunately, we've been having a series of uh, collateral damage incidents since we started having, uh, you know, these uh, security challenges, whether it is in the Northeast or in the Northwest or North Central or other parts of the country, uh, which uh, necessitates that we really have to examine how our air operations are. Uh, by the way, it may not be possible to completely eliminate, eliminate completely collateral damage. However, experience has shown, you know, from other places and from the trainings that we have, that there are methods, there are terminologies, there are, you know, uh, uh, trainings or, or, or processes that you can put in place that will reduce the incidence of collateral damage. Uh, permit me to say, just last week when the service chiefs were before, before the National Assembly, I think House of Representatives, the chief of air staff, among the things he said was that the difficulty they are having in operation is difficulty of targeting, which might lead to collateral damage. Unfortunately, he said this and we're having this with the army. So the point I am making is that while collateral damage could be accepted up to a certain limit, the rate at which we are recording ours, I must say, is just on the high side. So what is to be done? We have to put all this, you know, a professional training that reduces, uh, you know, collateral damage. There is uh, in other air forces or other forces that use uh, air, air assets, that's what you call collateral damage estimation. They're what we call a non-strike list. That's what we call, you know, and so many other things. Right from preparing for the operation, wherever you are having an uh, area operation, there should be situational awareness. You have a map, you mark it properly, you know where a hospital is, you know where a market is, you know where a school is. You also even know the, the normal routine of the people around there. All these are precautionary measures which will help you to comply with the uh, international humanitarian law requirement for all feasible measures to ensure that before you release your, you know, your, your, your ordinances that you are sure you have taken all reasonable effort to, you know, to, 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 to reduce collateral damage. And, uh, you know, since the 2017 run incident, we've had other incidents. But uh, with due respect, I think we have not done enough to raise the level of our training to ensure that uh, all these aspects, you know, are reduced so that we have less and less of these collateral damages. And we also have to look at the, you know, issue of compensation. There's, uh, in, uh, in aspects like this, there's what is called solatia. That is in plural, or solatium. It is a process where whenever the armed forces of any state cause damage, either loss in life or even a limb or houses to citizens, they are supposed to pay them. I remember as far back as 2017, there was, uh, when the run incident happened, there was a big debate whether the people are being compensated or not. Mm -hmm. Certainly, it's one of the global best practices. And uh, also, we will learn by doing, even though we don't hope this seems to happen, when a collateral damage happens like that, it is always good to quickly acknowledge it. If not, you allow incident of rumor, collateral, I mean, uh, 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 conspiracy theories going in. I must say that uh, this time around, one, if, if in any bad thing there is a good thing, I think the time it took for the uh, military to make a statement was relatively shorter than what we see at other, at other incidents. If you look at the incidents of, uh, that happened in, uh, in Nasarawa State, I think uh, some months back, up to today there was no 
any official statement, and it is not good. An official statement will not make those people to come back, but it shows that you have empathy, you have sympathy, and you also recognize that you have taken some people's life. Mm. All in all, I think the panacea for reducing collateral damage, if not eliminating it, is training and training and procedures, which currently are lacking in our operational setup. Sadiq, well said. Well, uh, you, you just mentioned that perhaps our military need uh, more training. Then what about their exposure and compliance to international humanitarian laws and cooperation with uh, international humanitarian agencies? Uh, where does this place us? Yes, uh, one of the principles of uh, international humanitarian law is... Uh, or taking all feasible precautions before attack. All feasible precautions. It means even before you decide the launching of your attack, from the planning of the operation, like I said, marking your maps, knowing what are the uh, 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 public places that are there, schools, hospitals, which you must avoid, even what kind of ordinance you are going to use. We do not know the ordinance used here. I hear the people saying bomb. But with due respect, a civilian will not know whether it is a bomb that was used, whether it was a rocket, whether it was a missile, whether it is guns that were used. All these four that I mentioned, they have different kind of degree of damage that they can inflict. And uh, a person controlling an aircraft or a, or a UAV, we say UAV here because uh, we, we've heard from the army that it is the army that uh, uh, the operation came from the army. Certainly the army, as of now, they do not have an aircraft. So I have to believe that... Uh, uh, the, the, the platform that was used must be one of these uh, uh, um, uh, Turkish uh, UAVs that they have called Berekta. So whatever, whether it is a UAV, whether it is a helicopter, whether it is a fixed wing aircraft, even the ordinance you are carrying is very, is, very, is very important depending on the target you are going to give. The most precise thing you have also is a, you actually will be a missile if the target fits a missile. But then you have bombs which has a larger diameter of causing damage. And uh, I must say also, sometimes uh, matching the platform to what you are going to attack. We do respect the director uh, uh, UAV has proved itself even in the Russian-Ukrainian uh, conflict that is going. But in most uses, what I observe is that the director is used for point target. For point target. A high value target, you want to take a leader of a group for point target, you don't use it for area target. What do you mean by area target? A large size group of people, even if that is what you want to take out, I don't think the director is the, is the best uh, you know, weapon to use. Having said that, one important thing that always leads to collateral damage invariably is intelligence. There's a difference between intelligence and the rumor. I have seen it, I have followed this thing. Uh, going back to the, to, the, to the event that happened in uh, Nasarawa, what, the, what I heard was that the military, they said they got an information from the Benue state government that some terrorists were, you know, assembling. Well, that is the first step of the information. For you as the man carrying the attack, that is not, that is not intelligence yet. That is just raw information. You have to refine it. You have to refine it and make sure. And even, you know, you know as, as somebody who is going to launch an attack, until the last minute, you continue updating your information, updating your information. What international law says, by the time you even arrive overhead the target, if you are not sure whether this is a bad guy or a good guy, whether it's a civilian, whether it is a bandit, if you are not sure, what international humanitarian law says is that you cancel the attack and go back to base. So if it's just like what they say in law, uh, if there is any, any doubt, you, you resolve it in favor of the accused. If you are in any doubt, I'm the pilot. This part who gives you the other, the pilot or the controller of the drone has the last, you know, uh, uh, authority to decide whether I'm dropping my bomb or not. If you are in any doubt, you cancel the attack and go home. These are some of the things that we have to teach our, you know, our, 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 this is so. The failure in intelligence, always when you find this kind of collateral damage, is failure in intelligence. We saw failure in intelligence in Iran, uh, in 2017. Because the intelligence that they got from the Americans was just raw information. There were people around Iran. This was completely translated as there were Boko Haram around Iran. That's what happened in Iran. It's the right. same failure of intelligence we saw in Nasarawa. Somebody told the military that people are converging somewhere and you went. So intelligence is very important. Right. Very quickly. Um would it be a factor that this operation, this routine uh, mission actually happened at night? And of course, the terrain uh, of the area. What uh, other necessary uh, you know, measures should have been taken considering the timing and of course the terrain? Well, uh, like I said, uh, you know, uh, there are many issues, even being familiarity with the area. 
what is the normal routine of the people what is the uh, you know the, the the reaction of the crowd uh, from what i heard i was not there that the the, the the drone made two passes okay he released the first ordinance and then went back uh with due respect even though it is easier for me sitting here to make that judgment outside the first distance i think ideally the person should have uh, you know the person controlling the drone should have how you should have observed how was the crowd you know uh, uh, behaving that would have maybe probably told him to reconsider the second launching of the of the attack but uh, again like i said it's a it's a situation the person controlling has to act but then whether it is night even the night time the daytime these are some these are some of the things and like i said a proper map marking would have uh, gathered information is this a village is there the presence of this? I heard of the presence that they were looking after terrorists, but then that is another thing. Even if they were terrorists, again, the international humanitarian law calls for proportionality. Am I going for two terrorists who entered a class with 10 children? It's a proportion. In that case, taking out the two terrorists doesn't make sense. Right. Now, Sadiq. So there's also the proportionality measure. Yes. Okay. Now, let me quickly come in there. Uh, you know, there was yet a second uh, a blast, meaning that... Uh, <laughs> Real-time monitoring and evaluation was lacking, you know, but that could have prevented further uh, collateral damage. So how do we uh, step up our real-time monitoring and evaluation before we let you go? Yes, like I said, you know, when you get the initial information, let's even assume they are terrorists or they are bandits. From the time you get the information that there are bandits in Area A, from the time you get your aircraft or your drone ready, up to the time you come overhead, there should be constant streaming of information. In an ideal situation, you should have one intelligence officer that's around that village to confirm that these people are bad guys and they are there. And until the last minute before you drop your, your, your ordinance, you must be sure that the situation changes because situation can be dynamic. And that is the difference now between a manned aircraft and, uh, and a drone. A drone, you know, there's nobody inside. Manned aircraft you know, the pilot might be able to make all these mental judgments. Unfortunately, no matter how we, we hype technology, there is no technology that will replace the human calculation, the human judgment, the, uh, the, the, the situation. I want to ask, maybe it's, if it's a manned aircraft, the pilot might have seen, maybe from the crowd, I can see children, uh, you know, the thinking will come that, ah, if uh, terrorists are going to attack, I don't expect them to go with children. Which if the terrorists are going to attack, I expect to see them in motorcycle. A pilot can make such judgments, but unfortunately, a drone cannot make such judgments. Yeah. Sadiq Garbashir, thank you very much indeed for joining us on Newsnight.